ICT, the coupling of ICT and, and medicine has the potent ability to increase access to vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. So it's, it's, a, it's a strong enabler for reducing inequities and reducing barriers for people that have su significant health needs. So look, it, it gets me excited. What came across all the speakers was that, you know, this is a real interesting space and, it, you know, it is new and it's evolving, but we can't be afraid of not getting in there and having a look and not not making some attempts to make change and then, you know, being, being aware that we might, may make mistakes, and Dr Ben Carson talked about that. We shouldn't be put off by the mistakes we make. We should be um, encouraged by those so that we can do a better job the next time. All of the speakers today really highlighted the absolute value, and at different levels, at a government level, at a, at a, at a regional um, board level, and, and you know, in my case, at a, at a local level as a GP, as an on-the-ground person, how much technology can influence the health of our nation? A kia ora and welcome to the second seminar in our Health Thought Leadership Series. Um, I'm Jo Jacobson, I'm GNI's National Health Lead. So welcome, it's absolutely delightful to have you all here. This auditorium seats 200 um, and as well as those of you who are in the audience, we have 100 people who are listening into the broadcast live from Kaitaia down to Bluff. Um, and so welcome to those who are listening in on the, on the webinar and a big shout out to the health team in Dunedin who are hosting their clients in the boardroom over a bite of lunch and watching the webinar on a big screen. So well done guys for getting that all together. And also we have been supported by our partners, the NZ Health Innovation Hub, Francis and her team, ProCare, Steve Bermott and Andrew Slater and, and their teams, and also Vigil Biomedical Technologies. So Keith Oliver, Alan and your teams, thank you very much. Many of you will know that Telecom GNI is about to rebrand itself as Spark and Spark Digital. And I'm delighted to share with you as part of that rebranding, um, Telecom and Spark Digital have identified health as one of its key investment priorities. So that's really stunning for all of us around the table. And whilst um, we're convinced that ICT and digital solutions are key enablers for improving health outcomes and for promoting a sustainable future for healthcare in New Zealand, it's undeniable that the arbiters of change in health are our clinical leaders, um, and it's our clinical leaders are the only ones who can make changes in our clinical workplaces. And we're going to hear from some of these respected leaders this afternoon. What I'd like to do now is to introduce you to Dr Lee Mathias. Um, Lee is a veritable wonder woman of change, and she was the founding director of Birth Care many, many years ago and delivered maternity services throughout the country to women in New Zealand. And Lee is now chair of a couple of major projects in Counties Manukau, the 20,000 Bed Days project and also Project SWIFT. Thank you very much. And um, just again, welcome uh, to everybody uh, to Auckland City Hospital. Um, I'm Lee Mathias and I am the Deputy Chairman of Auckland District Health Board and also the Chairman of Counties Manukau Health. Uh, I'm involved in a couple of quite big projects at the moment but I'll just focus on one in particular and that is um, the transformation of health services in South Auckland and that is what we are terming pro as Project SWIFT. It's about understanding that we can't carry on doing, uh, delivering health services in the way that we've been doing them for all of my time in the health sector, which is a long time, uh, that we actually have to change. And we have to change quite dramatically. So first up we have uh, Dr Lance uh, O'Sullivan. Oh, tēnā koutou katoa, a tua tahi māku mihi atu ki te tātou kaihanga i runga rawa, ko io te tīmatanga me te whakamutunga o ngā mea katoa. Tua rua huriana ngā mihi ki a rātou ko e whetu rangi te a rātou o tēnei rohe o tēnā rohe o tērā rohe puta noa te mutu e ngā mate haere haere hoki atu koutou. I tēnei wā huriana ngā mihi ki tēnei whare, ki tēnei marae mō tātou i tēnei wā, he wānanga, e whare wānanga, he whare whakaruru hau tēnei mō tēnei kaupapa ko te mātau ronga. Kia whaka pai, kia whaka tika anō te hauro, kia whaka hiki te hauro, te oranga o, o tātou o te, o te kāinga o te whenua nei. Nō reira ten, uh, te, te whare tūtonu, tūtonu, tūtonu. Tēnei wā huriana ngā, 
reo i te reo tūrua, kia whakamaramatu, kia tate kato. Kia ora Lee, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to GNI, to um, David and Joe from GNI for the invitation to come down here today. Um, just a special acknowledgement to my mentor, uh, my sorry, my student um, who I'm mentoring, uh, Ezekiel, and who's come down from Kaitaia uh, today to witness leadership in action. So, uh, <laughs> from the other panellists. <laughs> so, kia ora, Ezekiel, and to you. no hoki tuku I want to say thank you for the opportunity to come here today and talk about uh, how technology and health can be coupled to in, uh, improve health outcomes. In particular, I have an interest in health outcomes uh, affecting disadvantaged and vulnerable communities. In particular, um, disparate outcome, health outcomes, inequitable health outcomes. And I actually believe, and we've already heard a little bit today, that, uh, that actually vulnerable communities are likely to benefit significantly from the use of technology and health. And you know, with 54% of people in South Auckland, which we would consider a high risk and high needs community, having access to smartphones. So that's really exciting because I, I, I certainly subscribe to this belief that we need to look innovatively at, at, um, at ways to improve health outcomes for disadvantaged people and technology could be a real key. And we, we're using that in some way, in some fashion in, in our little um, part of the country. Awesome, it's up there. Okay, so, um, Lee, just a small correction. It's not actually that I believe every Māori child and father should have this opportunity. It's every child in New Zealand. Every child, every father in New Zealand should have the opportunity to embrace their child, uh, their, their father, and know that they will get, um, the, they will have protection, they'll have inspiration, they'll have role modelling and guidance as a, as, a, as a child looking into their father's eyes. And equally, the father can look into that child's eyes and realise that, that their child is a, a being of potential, a being of um, absolute wonder that will, will just knock this world out in the future. The, the, the point is not everyone, not every child, not every father has an opportunity to, to, to have this photo, this photo moment. So this is important because um, I've, got a, I've got a little bit of a, a passion for looking, making this sort of a, a photo opportunity for, for every father and every child in New Zealand. So, I'm talking a little bit about poverty-related disease, poverty-related preventable disease, it's really important to note. So the issues that drive poverty are significant, they're huge, they're, they're related to policy in decades, if not centuries, of issues. The question I have is, how can we use technology to address some of these important barriers to healthcare, these important drivers for disparate and inequitable outcomes? So access is a big issue for poverty, people living in poverty and inequitable disease. So do we ask ourselves the question, could technology address this? And I think today, my biggest feeling is absolutely yes, it can. 54% of people in South Auckland have access to a smartphone, therefore have access to internets and applications. Thank you to the team from the Counties Monaco. Um, that could enhance their health outcomes. Uh, quality care. The other thing is we talked about this at the, the brief session we had before this presentation was we can standardise care with decision, um, uh, clinical decision support software, et cetera, et cetera, applications that make sure that we as clinicians are doing a very um, well, uh, providing good quality care to, to the patients that need it um, the most. It's no good just having access to care, but if that care is not of a high quality. And uh, health literacy, we deal, you know, the people living in poverty are going to have, liter have health literacy um, problems. But you've, again, the health, uh, the county's Monaco team demonstrated how you can bring technology into people's home and allow health literacy to be increased immediately with um, relevant and culturally appropriate, say, um, information. The, the, the SO, SO at the bottom, the SO, SO is the same old, same old, doesn't work. So we have to think of innovative ways to change things, to do things. And um, yeah, so, 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 same old, same old. So, okay. Technology problems again. So, uh, I should have an extra few minutes for this. <laughs> okay, so it's coming, I think. So. I, I think it's not rocket science, and if um, Dr. Ben Carson was here, I'd say it wasn't brain surgery. Um, 
Some of the things we can do to address poverty-related preventable disease is not difficult. And, I'll, and if I go back to some of the, these are photos of me in Kaitaia. Um, inequitable disease, MRSA infection, super infection of eczema, skin infections of impetigo, infected eczema, cellulitis, infected scabies. These are all, these aren't, this is not brain surgery. This is very simple and technology could help to address these very important uh, disparate problems. So MRSA again, MRSA in the eye, MRSA on the face, the skin. You know, the, you know, I've looked after a child, premature baby. We got it through the rough time and any paediatric or neonatal specialist here would realise that we got this child through the roughest time of its life up to sort of three years and it succumbed to MRSA pneumonia. Caught from um, a preschool, a daycare, where there was just rampant MRSA skin infections. So I struggle when I talk to public health teams and say, hey, what are you going to do about MRSA? And I get told that it's so common, we don't do anything about it now. We, don't consider, we consider it less of importance than obviously TB and hepatitis and other um, and severe infectious public health problems. But when you see kids die of something that is preventable, poverty related, it's, it's a real challenge to your, you know, your beliefs. So, so the issue here is... Oh, the other thing, it's not rocket science. I mean, this, this is a child who came from south, somewhere in the south of the North Island or southwest of the North Island, somewhere around Palmerston. Am I getting too close? <laughs> and they had three months of a skin infection. Mum did everything right, and mum will be called by the media the typical sort of Māori solo parent who didn't listen, didn't take the child to the doctor, and um, wasn't um, aware enough of the issues. But it was, it was completely wrong. This mother had taken the child to the doctor four times, had been given three courses of antibiotics for which it was had completed it uh, and um, had this child who she loved dearly look like that for three to four months. It actually looks worse on close up. And I saw this child on a Thursday and this is what it looked like on a Tuesday after four months. So MRSA, it was, it was just that we, quality care is not always and given when you go into our health system, unfortunately. It was culturally inappropriate care. Māori child with a non healing skin infection in my clinic has got MRSA. So that was uh, a real, it's a real watershed moment for me in terms of what we need to do um, to make things better. So technology can allow quality to be consistent. So uh, connecting people with how, to health with technology. So I think this is the real opportunity because health and technology have come together. We have CT scanners, MRIs, we have all sorts of imaging, all sorts of diagnostics um, to make our job easier as clinicians. Diagnosis is faster, more accurate, um, short, short of stay in hospital perhaps, all these things. Technology has definitely helped. My, my real drive would be to see how we could allow access to be increased with technology. I think there's a gap between what we're doing with technology and within the clinical circles to how it can bridge the gap of people having access to healthcare. That's exciting to me and that's what we're doing up north. So can we fix it? Well, clearly we can. Cotramoxazole, three days later. Um, and, and I'm just going to show, because we, we've started up in Kaitai, and I'm just really proud to have met the team from Counties Marako, because we're doing similar work up in Kaitai in the far north. So it's a telemedicine program. We call it a virtual, virtual muko. Um, we, the muko program is a rheumatic fever-based uh, manawa order, korokoro order, so, uh, healthy heart through healthy throat. So we, we've been in, in the Kaitai community, we've been sending staff into 14 schools, 2,000 children doing throat swabs, but we've incorporated skins into that. The question is how do we actually reach the other 700 children that live in outlying areas and very, very remote with very limited um, health services and technology is the answer. So how can we can't send people into the schools but we can send technology? So the schools we're talking about, so this is Kai Tai here. So we have schools up around here and here and all over the place that we're going to be launching into. Sort of rural, you know. <laughs> I, know I know South Auckland has rural properties and I was just being smart, but this um, real rural New Zealand. So the idea is to... The idea is to have, you know, there's a community up here that gets a doctor every fortnight and a nurse maybe once or twice a week. But how can we make sure health stays in that community, owned by the community? Um, well, technology can do that. And so what we're doing, is, so these are the things that we'll see on any given day. 
Now these children, and this is probably say 50% of the snapshot of, of skins that we'll see on, on, on a week in Kaitaia, and you'll see them in South Auckland no doubt. But these kids are trying to learn at school. I just don't know how that could happen. You know, if that's not sore and um, irritating, it's gonna be, you know, they'll be pretty brave. So what we're doing in, in Kaitai in the far north is we're using, so we're using iPads and apps. So uh, Ruth, I met Ruth before, we're using an app. We've developed an app that sits on an iPad <clears throat> and it's, it's targeted at skins. And so if we, my question to you as clinicians is, if you saw some of these things on, you got given an image that was packaged up on an app and sent to you with some information, which is um, clinic, what I think clinically important, uh, a, 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 thermo a temperature, pulse oximetry to see if they're tachycardic, febrile, you know, some weight, because we're going to give them treatment. You know, if you had a, a family member or a member of the community of that school taking, collecting this data, this information, and packaging it up and putting it onto a secure server that then gets beamed down to a doctor or a nurse sitting in Kaitaia, could you make a clinical call on some of these things that you're seeing 90% of the time you could say, yep, I can treat that child without even seeing them. They don't have to leave their community. Better still, the authors of their own health are the people that are running this program in their community. So the people that we're giving the apps to, the iPads, the clinical uh, technology, the digital thermometers, etc., And they will be caring for their own children. They'll be caring. This is just skins, but we're just starting. This is just a start from what we, what we think we could achieve. So essentially, child goes into school, Three times a week, there'll be someone with the app, an iPad, all this stuff, and they'll say, who has sores on their skin? Or, and they'll take a photo, they'll bundle up this information and send it to us. We'll make a decision. They'll get some antibiotics, and these kids will remain well in that little beautiful part of, of New Zealand, up into Harpoa, that is. So, the exciting thing is, where to from here? And, uh, you know, just coming here today was exciting. Just actually coming and listening to some of the opportunities and listening to the great presentation that I heard before lunch that was happening in counties Monaco because it makes us think that we are on the right track. So about personal responsibility, technology and our, and our initiative actually is allowing people to have that personal responsibility and we, you know, we're quite comfortable, I'm quite comfortable of allowing these pit communities to have a lot more control over their health than we need to have. So well, what's, what's the possibilities? Well, you know, spirometers are the same size as your own, you know, you get that Bluetooth to your iPhone. This wonderful thing that I spoke at a presentation recently at the Population Health Intensive and that we've spoken at. And this um, doctor gave me, sent up his, I think it's a Welsh Allen digital stethoscope. Now what's, what's fantastic about this is it can save 12, 30 second sound bites of chest sounds and you can Bluetooth it. So imagine if there's a person in that wonderful community of Tahapu, which is 135 kilometers north of Kaitaia, who has a child who's got a normal temperature but has had a cough for two or three weeks. And you can, with hopefully a degree of um, accuracy, put, say to that person who's the mum or the, the school administrator, record four, you know, four parts of the anterior posterior chest, maybe the auxiliary region, their, their, heart sound, uh, their chest sounds, and you know, send it, package it up with that information that's going to be on the app and send it through to us and we can hopefully make some decisions. This won't cause harm, I don't believe, because these communities aren't getting served in the first place. So I actually think we can do this. And I don't think we should not do it because of lots of reasons that I've heard. <laughs> um, and as I was speaking to someone before, um, you do have to shake the tree and you will get bits of wood falling on you, but it's usually dead wood, um, <laughs> to actually make change. So uh, it's a little bit, probably a little bit uh, of a finishing note. But anyway, I just want to say thanks again for the opportunity to come down here today. I'm going to learn more than I um, have been able to t uh, present, no doubt. So, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou katoa. Thank you very much, Lance. Our, our next speaker is Dr. David Grayson. Thank you very much, Lee, and kia ora, Lance. It was uh, very, I feel very privileged to be following you. Uh, oh, cool. 
have got my slides. Great. So thank you, and uh, welcome to the people watching in uh, the deep, deep south. I heard I was in a clinic this morning, and uh, on my way in, heard on the news that there's a little crisis looming down south with the southern DHB, actually uh, a bit of a problem with the budget uh, overblow being a bit even more than, uh, than, they, than they realized. And I think that is what we're actually looking at and talking about here. We can try and cost, reduce costs as much as we can, but really the big, the big gains are going to be working uh, at the front line and taking on technology and using technology in the best possible way to assist us to overcome uh, the more expensive way of doing things. And pretty much that means the traditional way of doing as much and much as you can in the hospital no longer just, just doesn't fit. And that's where the real promise to me is the use of technology is going to allow me as a specialist, so I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon, it's much easier to say, uh, and, uh, and that I can actually support the likes of Lance and our primary care and our community workers, and most of all the patients themselves, to actually be doing most of the care that they need to, primarily keeping themselves well, and that includes even if you have a chronic condition that you can stabilize and keep your condition under control. So that's really my role, I, as I see as my role. And so I, uh, when I was thinking about how I was going to do this talk, um, came on this idea, and uh, it's a little bit embarrassing because we now really do have the, uh, the ultimate brain surgeon in the room, and I'm, <coughs> I'm here talking to you about something to do with the brain. Uh, the, uh, the connectome is a, uh, an expression for work that has been done to try and map all the pathways uh, within the brain, the structure of the brain, but also the information flow within the neurons of the brain. And I think it's kind of a nice sort of thing for us to think about how if we're addressing this problem, and I'm coming at it from, and been asked to talk about it from a regional perspective, and so I see that, that in a region that it's really our role to connect everything up in the region and, as I say, to support the patients primarily, and that's the co-design, but we need to be working as clinicians and caregivers with our patients, with our communities, to actually help them to support themselves. And we're, we're now thinking about in, in Counties Manukau, where, where I work, that our next sort of st stage, we've gone through this phase of stabilizing things to try and reduce some of the pressure on the hospital, but our next real emphasis we're going to look at is, is what's called self-management support. And that's what is our role as clinicians to help people to help themselves. And that's what we're seeing Lance is actually doing ahead of us all. Uh, and so I really take my hat off to you, Lance, for doing that. So this, the Human Connectome has been a project that is uh, underway and it's uh, going, going at fast pace and it's really trying to understand in absolute detail not only just the structure of things and are now again coming back to the regional perspective, it's our structures that we have, but more importantly the relationships of all of those connections that need to occur between the hospital staff, hospital doctors, primary care doctors, GPs and particularly the patients themselves. And so I'm a pretty simple surgeon, and so I've just got simple messages, and, and I hopefully won't be uh, anywhere beyond my 15 minutes. Uh, I really want us to think, if we're going to address these, these big complex issues, and, the, and they're, they're right here and now, and coming at us faster and faster, as, as, as everything does, uh, that we have to actually change our way of thinking. And you'll hear a lot of, there's a lot of talk around networks, clinical networks and all sort of networks, but to me it's actually really understanding network theory and network science and how we actually apply that to our everyday lives and to our work that we do. And we can take a lot of lessons from industry and particularly obviously IT industry because that's really the key bottom line for IT is, is how you make networks function well and optimise their, their, um, their functioning but there's just so many analogies that we can look at and start to understand and use. And it's hugely exciting to me. I think it's one of the biggest changes we need to take, and particularly like in all of our education, just how we switch our thinking and take uh, on the ideas of what it means to be working in a, in a truly well-functioning network. Um, and because the thing is that every individual that we are dealing with is they are they're surrounded by their own networks of relationships. And even within your body, you'll start seeing, just like within the work around the connectome, that it's actually all around the network, uh, how a network functions that we actually do work on. And so it's within our region how we, as the components or the nodes in that network, actually come together uh, and work much better together. 
And I think the nice thing about this, it takes away that whole historical divide that you have of primary care and secondary care and tertiary care, quaternary care. You, you do away with all that and you start to think as one more about how we're actually getting to this goal of providing the best uh, outcomes for, for the individuals that we're dealing with. So that's why I like it too. Um, <clears throat> and it's, uh, the other bit of information that I came across as I was researching this for this talk was um, the concept of a locavore. And uh, some of you who are right into your health foods and, and uh, local um, farmers markets, I previously worked in Hawke's Bay for 10 years, which was the origin of farmers markets in New Zealand. Uh, and the locavore movement is a uh, movement where you're really trying to emphasize as much as possible from your local, uh, from your local environment. And I think it's kind of nice to us to think about and uh, Adrian Groper is a, uh, a doctor in the US who, who mentioned this, this uh, or made this analogy. Uh, and he uh, is thinking about how you can, and, and again, as Lance is doing, how you can be as self-sufficient as you can for an individual, for your population in your region. Uh, and the, the great promise and, and potential of technology is that you can actually be still tapping into whole, the whole world's information. Uh, to help you do that and not be having to then be shifting yourself and transporting everywhere. And what uh, one thing is we're doing with, and I was explaining to Lance before, with the work with IBM is the huge potential of IBM's uh, Watson. Have any of you uh, heard about Watson? Watson is their machine that is the, uh, the huge big machine brain of, uh, of IBM that actually is now, I think, is the world's chess champion. I think <laughs> taken on most chess champions. But it's, it's a basically, it's, a, it's machine learning and it's going to be just, it can just hoover in all data and information from all around the world at any, and they're now using it in healthcare to help make decent decisions for any given situation. Um, you know, as a doctor, you, you have a reasonable amount of information stacked in your head and you can access stuff, but uh, really this uh, potential of something like Watson, which actually does all of that sort of thinking for you a lot, is just going to be massively, poten uh, massive success. And even as will have ultimately happen, you as any individual, you won't even need to be going to a doctor. So, um, what I would like to uh, just bring to your attention in this terms of this work around networks and, and how we manage data is, is a, uh, um, a movement in, uh, in the States again. And I was talking to my daughter, 12-year-old daughter, and, and just explaining the talk I was giving today. Uh, and she said, at this stage, I have to go hashtag we, data, we the data. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep up. you got to keep up. Uh, <laughs> But this is a, it's a fascinating uh, bit of work where there's people who it's, it's crowdsourcing really to look at how we actually manage all this data that we're just generating ourselves by the use of cell phones, smartphones, uh, and all that we do. Um, and how that can be, how we can work together and look at how that data can be used. And it's, you often hear the expression about big data and the role of that, that that can play in terms of how we approach these problems that we're facing and find workable solutions to work on it. But the key part of it, and this uh, Emily Aiken is one of the people involved in this project, is really the data is important and likewise the information that comes out of that, but actually what it really comes down to is the trust. And that's really what we have to get to, is trust within our system of us as clinicians, trust with, our, uh, with the individuals, patients that we're working with, trust between ourselves as clinicians as to how we actually are going to help, help patients to the best um, of our ability and not get sidetracked by all of the uh, potential political problems that tend to always seem to overcome us. And Eric Berlow is one of the founders of this We The Data movement, and uh, I'm putting a little plug. Uh, I work part-time for Koawatia, which is the Improvement Innovation Centre at Counties Manukau, and we have a uh, yearly forum now, which is called the APAC Forum. And I'd really love you all to come uh, and see Eric Berlow as one of the keynote speakers that we have uh, coming this year. Uh, and if you look up We The Data, it's wethedata.org if you're going online to look it up. It's a fabulous video. Uh, he's a frequent TED Talk um, speaker. Um, and he, uh, in the work that they've done looking at this, they've, they've put out all of the potential sort of issues around managing data that uh, could probably sort of be thought of and they went to hundreds of experts and they've been 
honing it all down and they've come up with just four key themes that they think are the critical issues as we move into all of this uh, exciting but challenging world. And those key, key themes are that we have platform openness, digital trust and data literacy which is aligned obviously with health literacy uh, and digital access. Um, and because that will then um, take around in terms of in the um, management of that then we're going to be building trust and its transparency is a key for that. If we have to have transparency and be open uh, with all use of our data, bearing in mind the security issues. But the best thing I think for overcoming um, the security problem is, is me, if I'm a patient, I say, yeah, that's fine, just help me to do whatever needs to be done to get better. And I, and I think we'll hopefully see this with the upcoming generations, won't be so concerned about um, the actual security issues that potentially can be a barrier for us. And so as an example of um, this potential gain uh, that can be done if you're using technology in a, in a, in, in a, in a good way, has been demonstrated by Veterans Affairs in the States. And they have just released a report of uh, their work using particularly telehealth and telemedicine, uh, as, as uh, Lance has been demonstrating up north. Um, and in, in their system, uh, which is across all of the, the Veterans Affairs uh, units in the States, they've actually achieved, made just in one year, just by the startup of this program, of encouraging more what we call virtual clinics and virtual um, encounters. So using technology in the way that uh, you can save the actual cost for people coming to a centre uh, and um, they've really been able to reduce not only the actual amount of time that may be otherwise spent in a hospital setting uh, but with that they've had a massive drop in the, in the use of costs and we've seen that in our work in counties Manukau and uh, it's the real potential I think that, that this holds. So my final little bit is a plug to, uh, for you all to come to Melbourne uh, in September. We have the APEC Forum to hear the likes of uh, Eric Berlow. Uh, but I think that's my main message that I'd like you to think about is how we incorporate network theory and network science into our thinking and our work as we work and uh, take on the challenges presented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Before I introduce our next guest, Mrs. Anne Colby, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ben Carson to the room. Welcome, and I hope you travelled well to get here. Thank you. Our next guest is Mrs. Ann Colby, who needs no introduction in, on the Auckland City site. Anne is a paediatric surgeon who has been around here not quite as long as I have, but almost. <laughs> and Anne is currently the chairman of the National Health Committee. The National Health Committee is that government organisation which is charged with looking at what services we should be providing, that is funding, uh, from the public purse. Thanks, Lee. Um, thank you very much to Genai and to the Health Innovation Hub um, for convening this meeting. And uh, it's a privilege, gentlemen, to uh, take part in a panel with you. Um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of your input. Um, these are my disclosures of interest. Uh, when the National Health Committee was reconvened in its current format um, at the end of 2011, we were given a statutory remit to manage um, from an evidence-based technology across New Zealand and across Vote Health. We term technology under the WHO definition, so it is systems, models of care, procedures, interventions, devices, pharmaceuticals, um, and all types of things. <laughs> <laughs> what was our remit? What is the remit that we've been given? Basically, it is to obtain the best quality health, wellness and independence um, outcomes for the citizens of this country 
in a way that demonstrates measurable value for money so that we make wise investments with all of the resources we have available to us in the health system, that we do that in a way that can be sustained in the medium to long term. We are in the strategic medium to long run business, not in the short term business. And we were given an additional remit, and that is to enhance health's contribution to GDP. I think we should take a bow. As I travel around the world, I think there are few health systems around the world that are as good as ours. And ours is only good because of the contribution that every citizen and every person in this country makes, and also the contribution that the teams that lead our health service make. This is the Legatum 2013 Prosperity Index, and this is the economic part of it, and you can see how we fare. This index takes into account over 95% of the world's population and 95% of the world's GDP. For the last five years, New Zealand has ranked fifth on the international scale in how its citizens determine whether or not we are a prosperous nation. This is the latest mirror, mirror on the wall released from the Commonwealth Fund. It also says, for the investment that we make in health, where are we? Here, per capita. These are the outcomes we get on the international stage. Well done, New Zealand. Seriously well done. So what are the challenges and therefore the opportunities that we face? And how does health information technology help us meet those challenges going forward? How do we achieve the outcomes we want collectively as a nation by working together? Here are the challenges. The things I'd like you to note on this PowerPoint are how much of GDP it is predicted we will continue to spend on health if we return to the historic rate of growth, and I'll come back to that. I'd like you also to see the difference between expenditure and revenue, and I'd like you to see how that plays into national debt, and I'd like you to keep that in mind, please. Like every country in the world, our population is growing and it's ageing. That brings some challenges. How do we manage the increasing demand and how do we manage the long-term conditions um, that we need to manage effectively in the future? And how do we do that when we are changing the taxation structure? When the demographics will change the balance um, between those people who are paying tax and those people who are the recipients, particularly of health care, that comes from our tax dollar. The big spenders are New Zealand super and health. And this graph tells us what will happen, this is the predicted trajectory if we return to previous spending, this is what's currently happening, and this is what we need to do in health to enhance GDP so we can truly deliver the systems we want to deliver to every citizen, and that includes you and me. We have currently $15 billion of vote health in this country, and we have health insurance in the private sector and out-of-pocket spending. There is a tight and good partnership in this country about how we spend our health dollars. We need to protect and enhance that, and we need to make sure we use this money effectively. There are drivers of expenditure, but some of those drivers, and technology is a key one, are also enablers. We need to harness the enabling, and you've heard about the importance of doing that at practical, sensible <coughs> local and regional levels from both Lance and David. So, 
Where does the NHC fit in this? We are responsible for providing evidence-based recommendations to the Minister of Health and Cabinet about how to prioritise the spend to achieve the remits I showed you on the first slide. We do that across four domains, and it's important to remember that, and it's important to know that we are required to implement the recommendations we give must have an impact and they must land in the sector if we're to be successful. We operate on models of care. You heard Lee talk about the fact that she wants to understand, as a governor in a district health board, what the roadmap looks like and how we work together to move the resources around. So, it is excellent to develop pathways of care but all the clinicians in this room and the managers know that a pathway of care won't land unless it is underpinned by a sound business model that is sustainable. Here is an example of a model of care. The things I want you to note are that it is focused on outcomes and that the outcomes cross a lot of domains that there is the word implementation and there, is a, there are a set of feedback loops. Plans are one thing, strategy and carry through is another and processes have to be tweaked continually if they're to deliver satisfactory outcomes. So let's go to personal responsibility, something we're all responsible for. Personal responsibility in health is about the autonomy of patients and citizens to choose what they believe is right for them. Economists tell us that that is consumer sovereignty. But to have good consumer sovereignty requires clear data, information and knowledge. The right people at the right time and it needs to be trustworthy and reliable. Without that, we will get market failure. That's the importance of te health technology information systems. In health, as managers and clinicians, we are all professionals and as such we have a duty of care to the citizens and the populations that we serve. We have a duty of care to deliver good care that results in good outcomes within the resources that are available to us. We are all trained in various systems, and I'm using medicine here, but there are plenty of other systems in other professional groups, including management to remind us of the importance of that professional responsibility and duty. We are also trained to live within the resources we have available to us and make the very best use of them, whether they be human, capital, infrastructure, um, disposables, whatever, or money. Information gets exchanged and put in front of citizens and patients in various ways, but the most important way is the trusted professional relationship between professional management and professional clinicians and the patients that they care for. That relationship means that the information can be transferred technologically in lots of different ways and that's changing markedly. But it doesn't take out the human factor that needs to be there to interpret and manage the information in the patient-clinician um, contract. This are, these two slides are from the New Zealand Future Datas Forum. It's a new forum chaired by Mr John Whitehead, the immediate past secretary of the New Zealand <coughs> Treasury, who's just stepped down as a governor of the World Bank. Health is not alone in trying to understand how data works and how it connects us. 
In fact, health needs to be properly connected to the rest of the system and across whole of government if we are to deliver on our complex mandate. <coughs> Here is one example of how connecting data at a high level matters. This is a young man, a fictitious story, who from the age of three had lots of social input, um, education, uh, youth corrections, youth justice, social services, work and income, but by the age of 20, he was incarcerated in prison, serving a 12-year term. The system failed him. The system failed his family. The system failed the taxpayer. If we could connect that data, which is what the Data Futures Forum is trying to do, then we might have been able to deliver better outcomes for that young man, his family and his community. Connectivity matters. Knowledge, data, information, as Sean Hendy and the late Sir Paul Callaghan have told us really clearly, coupled with innovation, and we have plenty of this in the number eight wire fencing company, uh, country that we are, um, coupled with connectivity is the way to turn our economy from one that is based largely on primary producing industries, a very good foundation, I might add, into one that is enhanced by high-tech manufacturing. <coughs> we need to embrace the providers, the innovators, the inventors and the manufacturers of health technology and information technology and we need to work together to deliver the best outcomes. So what does the forward strategy look like? In order to deliver on the remit that the country has, we need to have informed, engaged citizens. Citizens who can practice their consumer sovereignty. We need engaged and professional healthcare managers and clinicians. We need the right data and information in the right place at the right time and we need to trust in that data and information. And we need time. Clinicians are time poor and everything else rich and it takes time to explain and do these things. I see Lance smiling. I hope he's smiling for the right reasons. <laughs> so, Everyone in this room who's involved in technology development, you are the enablers. We need this technology to land in the sector. We need it to be fit for purpose. We need it to provide measurable value for money for the whole system and for New Zealand. We need you to work together. Everything needs to be connected. We need the tools and the strategies to be sustainable and we need, hopefully, for them to have good export potential. We, the sector, will support you, but we need your help as much as you need ours. Thank you. Hey, Garson, you're the dumbest kid in the world. <laughs> you weren't meant to be a failure, Benny. And you can control your temper, but and you can bring your dummy. grades up too, oh. I know you can. Yeah. I'm dumb, mother. No, you ain't. You a smart boy. You gonna go to the library and pick out two books, and at the end of the week, you're gonna hand me a written report about what you read. Why you waste all that time watching the TV? If you use that time to develop your God-given gifts, wouldn't be long before folks was watching you on TV. Mother, I wanna be a doctor. You can be anything you wanna be in this life long as you're willing to work at it. I always said you can do anything anyone else can do. Only you, you can, can do, do it better. better. <laughs> I first heard about Ben Carson in 2003. And as soon as I heard the story, I thought we must get that man involved with books and homes. It's so inspirational what his mother did, and it shows kids can go from nothing to being the best in the world. The person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. Just seeing the children yesterday was, was phenomenal. Seeing that facility filled up with children who had bust in from everywhere 
and them calling out Ben's name. Uh, I mean, I've never heard so much energy. I've never seen children so fired up. And I'm getting so much feedback back from the teachers who are saying their kids are fired up and they want to be doctors. You rise to the top if you have the right mindset and just don't sort of give up and say, oh, poor me, I'm a victim. The 61st Annual National Prayer Breakfast. One speaker getting even more media attention than President Obama. We spend a lot of money on health care, twice as much per capita as anybody else in the world, and yet not very efficient. So about 15 minutes after it ended, I got a phone call from the organizers mm -hmm. saying that the White House was very upset and that I need to call the president and apologize. When did we reach a point where you have to have a certain philosophy because of the color of your skin. We already spend way more than enough money on health care, and I want to do it in such a way that we put the power in the hands of the people to control their own health care and put that relationship, that doctor-patient relationship, back together. Do you have presidential aspirations? It is not something that I desire to do, mm -hmm. but I have so many people asking me, uh, and as a patriotic American, I, I certainly have to think about it, but it wasn't what I was thinking about when I retired. Success is determined not by whether or not you face obstacles, but by your reaction to them. And if you look at those obstacles as a containing fence, they become your excuse for failure. Thank you. Well, always delighted to come to the beautiful country of New Zealand. This is actually the fourth time uh, that I've been here. And uh, really, we're here to, uh, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Duffy Books and Homes. And uh, today at uh, Parliament in Wellington, uh, the 10 millionth book was presented. And uh, to me, it, it, it's really very poignant because, you know, my life was changed so dramatically by reading. And it was, it's such an empowering thing. And uh, I actually believe that physicians and people in healthcare are some of the very best people to be pushing education because we are actually the most educated people on the planet. Nobody has as much education as, uh, as physicians do. And yet, uh, we frequently have a tendency to confine ourselves to our laboratories and our operating rooms and our societies and kind of uh, exclude ourselves from the populace. I, I think that's probably uh, a mistake. And uh, I'm fond of telling people in America that five physicians were involved in the Declaration of Independence. And physicians also signed the Constitution and uh, the Bill of Rights. And we used to be much more involved in what was going on. And I think things were going a whole lot better then, too. You know? <laughs> physicians rather than lawyers, you know? But, uh, and, and people always seem to think that it's strange when physicians get involved in, in things outside of medicine. But no one seems to think it's strange when lawyers get involved in things outside of law. I just, I see something wrong with that. And I always encourage more physicians. And, and the reason I encourage physicians and scientists to get involved, particularly in the public arena, is because we're trained to make decisions based on evidence as opposed to on ideology. And you're always going to do better when you make decisions based on evidence. So, but at any rate, I would have to say that we're also dealing with the most important things that people have. You know, when I was an intern at Johns Hopkins, I was duly impressed. I would go on those wards and I would see all these people. The CEO of this company, president of this organization, crown prince, queen of this nation in many cases, dying of some horrible disease. 
And every single one of those people would have gladly given every penny and every title for a clean bill of health. And you begin to understand what we are dealing with. By far the most important thing a person has. And people really don't think about it that often. But if you had the choice of having a billion dollars, but you had to be quadriplegic, or no money, but you were whole, I don't think it would take many people very long to figure out which one they would take. So when you talk about value of what we're dealing with, there is nothing that's more valuable. And that's why I'm so adamant about the fact that the most important thing that you have should be under your control and not under the control of somebody else. Now, you know, I did retire last year. Some people say, well, why did you retire? I had a very good reason to retire. Somebody told me that neurosurgeons die early. <laughs> and uh, I didn't believe it, so I wrote down the names of the last 10 neurosurgeons I knew who died, calculated the average age of death, and it was 61. <laughs> and um, I said, if I'm still alive, I'm going to retire when I'm 61. So that's why I decided that that was probably a very good time to do it. But uh, it was a, a wonderful career. I had an opportunity to operate on about 15,000 people. I still see a lot of my patients uh, all over the place. And that is extraordinarily <coughs> gratifying. I remember my birthday last year. I was in Alabama speaking. And uh, there were about 2,000 people, and we had Q&A afterwards. And a lady way in the back stood up and raised her hand. She said, I want to wish you a happy birthday. And uh, she said, 20 years ago, I gave birth to a little baby girl who had such severe cranial deformities. Everybody said, let her die. Everybody but you. You were the only one who were willing to do anything. And not only do I want to wish you a happy birthday, but here is my 20-year-old daughter to present you with a cake. I'll tell you, that was just such a wonderful feel. Everybody was so emotional. But, you know, to be able to see those kinds of things and to realize that, that you've had the privilege of being able to intervene in someone's life in that manner is probably more gratifying than virtually anything else you do. You know, I sit on a couple of Fortune 500 corporate boards with uh, some extremely well-known and very wealthy people. And uh, they're always saying to me, you know, what you do is so much more important than anything that we do. They all recognize it. And, you know, we should be extraordinarily proud but also humbled by the fact that people put into our hands the most important thing that they have. And it's our job to give it back to them in an enhanced way. But, you know, as a physician, you know, I was pretty much focused like everybody else on here's the patient, what can we do to get this patient well? And, uh, you know, things were going along very well. I have nothing to complain about. But about 12 years ago, something happened. All of a sudden, I would be in the operating room, and the clock became important to me. I used to have what's known as a camel's bladder. I could operate all day, never have to take a break. All of a sudden, I needed to take a break. I said, something's going on here. And I went and talked to my good buddy, Pat Walsh, who was the chairman of urology. And uh, I said, Pat, what do you think's going on? He said, Hey, you probably got a little prostatitis. Let's try a little antibiotic. That didn't work. He said, I bet you got a little focal hypertrophy. Let's try some Flomax. Well, that didn't work. He said, well, I know you had a PSA and it, it wasn't very elevated, but let's just repeat it. It was slightly elevated. He said, I think you should have a prostate biopsy. Now, if anybody ever told you a prostate biopsy doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt them, okay? <laughs> they left that one word out. I mean, 
after about the sixth core biopsy, I'm saying, you know what, cancer's not that bad. Let's just, uh, <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, you know, once it was done, you know, he said, you know, very little chance that you have cancer, maybe 18% top chance. I said, nevertheless, I need to know as soon as you know something. So the next day I'm operating, get a call, a nurse holds the phone up to my ear, and I hear, not only do I have prostate cancer, but I have a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. I subsequently got an MRI done to make sure it hadn't metastasized. And I was expecting when I came out of the MRI, a neuroradiologist to be there to say, everything's fine, no worries, but there was no neuroradiologist there to say that. And the technician handed me my films and I went up to my office and put them up on the view box. And my heart sank because I saw all these lesions up and down my spine. I checked the name to make sure it was me, and it was. And I just went and sat down at my desk and started contemplating. And I remember when I was a kid, nine years old, sitting on the ghetto stairs, looking through the building across the street out of which all the windows had been broken. And a sunbeam was streaming through it. It made me think about my life and the future. And I remember thinking that I would probably never live to be more than 25 years old. Because that's what I saw around me. Both my favorite cousins were killed. I saw people on the street with bullet holes and stab wounds. And that's just what I figured. There I was twice that age. And I said, you have nothing to complain about. It's been a good life. And then my senior PA came in, who's been with me my entire career, also retired when I retired. And she said, let me see it, let me see it. I knew it wasn't going to show anything. I said, it's over there on the board. And she went and looked at it and came back with the longest face imaginable. The next day, on the radio, they were announcing that I had a, a glioblastoma. And then I had... Uh, Lung cancer, liver cancer, bone cancer, you name it, I had it. I was dying. I had died already. <laughs> One lady called from Boston, and she said, I heard Dr. Carson was dead. I want to speak to him. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> it was just amazing. But, uh, but the outpouring of sentiment really impressed me. I mean, we had 10 big bags of cards and letters from all over the world, from janitors to the president and the first lady, saying that they were praying for me. I had no idea that so many people cared. And uh, I think the Lord just got tired of hearing about me <laughs> because it turned out that the lesions on the MRI were a congenital anomaly of the bone marrow. It just looked like metastasis. And I was able to have surgery by Pat Walsh, who invented the nerve-sparing prostatectomy. And I'm cancer-free today, 12 years later. So, you know, it all worked out in a, in a very nice way. But during that episode, people sent me so much stuff. I mean, it was like FedEx every five minutes was coming to the door with some potions and some pills and, you know, all kinds of things that people were sending me. But also literature, all kinds of literature. I started you know, digesting all this stuff. And it really dawned on me how incredibly important nutrition is. And the whole concept of wellness is in our lives. And so much of medicine is directed toward sickness. And so little of it directed toward wellness. And I really came to the conclusion that if everybody ate three well-balanced meals a day, drank six to eight glasses of water or water-equivalent substances, exercised regularly, got regular sleep, and did not put harmful substances in their bodies, most of us would be out of work. <laughs> we have nothing to worry about. They're not going to do it. <laughs> that's, that's a fact. But, you know, we, we need to be thinking about policies, things that actually incentivize people to do the right thing. Because I think that's where we're really going to be able to, to, you know, have a lot of savings. But that also got me very interested in healthcare reform. 
And, you know, I have been working with a number of people in the United States. Now, you know, the left wing doesn't like me because I don't like Obamacare. Uh, but there's a reason that I don't particularly like it. And you've heard part of it. It's because your health is the most important thing you have. There is nothing else you have that even comes close to that. And to put that in the hands of bureaucrats, I don't think is a good idea. And you know, the big scandal, the big VA scandal, I'm sure you heard about that even over here, uh, people dying, not being able to get care. I've had an opportunity to work in some VA hospitals. And there are many extremely fine people who work in these VA hospitals. But the problem is there are so many layers of bureaucrats between those fine people and the patients that things get delayed inordinately. And it hurts those people. You know, it hurt me to see that. But, you know, I said in one interview that it was a blessing from God, the VA scandal, because it shows us what happens when you put layers and layers of bureaucracy between people and healthcare providers. Of course, the left wing media immediately came out and said, Carson says that God wants veterans to die. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I get a kick out of them, to be honest with you. It seems like the more they attack me, the more popular I become because they're so ridiculous. But, uh, but, it, but at any rate, you know, I don't think people actually need to be enemies about it because what we really all want is good health care for people. In the United States, as I said on the video, we spend more than twice as much per capita on health care as the next closest nation. And yet, it's a disaster. And we can do so much better than that. So I've actually you know, proposed other ways to do things. Um, first of all, you know, I do believe that the use of technology is a tremendous boon for us. You know, telemedicine, I've you know, been to some of the universities where that's really pushed in a big way. It really provides much better care, particularly for people in, in distant rural areas. Um, being able to use telemetry and get data to people who can interpret it, tremendous advance. No question about it. One of the exciting things in neurosurgery uh, is the development of robotics. Right now, the standard robotics are too gross and too cumbersome. But uh, you know, I, I and some other people have been working with some inventors. There's stuff coming that is really amazing through a, a, a relatively small access point. Uh, you know, you can put something into the basilar cistern and blow it up the size of this room and see all the perforators, find a base of an aneurysm, encircle it, close it off through minimally invasive surgery. Patient goes home in a day or two. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are coming. And it really is extraordinarily exciting. Some, sometimes people get concerned and they say, well, that's gonna put me out of business. It's not gonna put you out of business. It's actually gonna create more business because there'll be actually more things that can be done as we develop these technologies. And it's really gonna be up to our imagination and creativity. And it also removes uh, you know, some of the, the problems because, you know, face it, it's not something we like to talk about in medicine. But some people just really aren't that good. You know? And uh, you know, it kind of eliminates that. And you know, they, they have good brains, you know, they, they can think well, but my God, you wouldn't want them to operate on your dog. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it kind of eliminates that whole thing and, and just lets that intellect flow. And I think that's gonna be extremely good for, for all people. But another thing that I think is very helpful, particularly in terms of, of saving money, electronic medical records. Um, you know, you, you're skiing, and you fall down, you break your ankle, and you're taken to the hospital. And you have your 
electronic medical record embedded in a credit card, your ring, a necklace, something on you. They can pop it in a computer, get your data, what you're allergic to, what medicines you're on, what surgeries you've had before. You know, an x-ray is done, maybe they see a little spot on your chest and go back and see, was that spot there before? How long has it been there? You know, these kinds of things not only enhance safety, but tremendous costs. Now, you know, I've advocated that that information, however, always be kept with the patient and not made public, not available uh, in cyberspace. Because your personal medical information is very private information. There's absolutely no way that anybody else should have access to that without your permission. I feel extremely strongly about that, but we have the technology to be able to do that now. Health savings accounts are the key linchpin uh, for, the, for the system that I've proposed. People, and there are various ways to fund that for much less money than is paid traditionally. And with your HSA, you get to decide who you want to see. You get to decide along with your health care provider, what test you need. And think about it, when you're the one who's responsible, the doctor's not going to order five CAT scans when you only need one. You're not going to let him order five CAT scans. He's not going to want to do it because he knows that impacts upon your HSA. So it's going to make people a lot more careful about things. They're going to be looking at the cost. People are also going to be looking for efficiency and effectiveness because now they are the ones that are responsible. I remember in the United States when the food stamp program uh, first came out, a lot of people were skeptical. They said, you know, if you give food stamps to, to people who are irresponsible, they, they won't know what to do with them. And they'll go out, you know, they'll buy porterhouse steak the first five days and then they won't have any money left and they'll be saying, I'm going to starve. But it didn't work that way. People very quickly learn how to apportion their food stamps so that they last it until their next allocation the next month. People are not stupid, and or, or less some aren't, uh, <laughs> and and they will generally learn uh, what to do with that money. And if you have a, a HSA, and you know you sprain your ankle, and if you need an x-ray done, it comes out of your HSA. You need a physical exam done for a job, it comes out of your HSA. Birth control pills, it comes out of your HSA. So, you know, there's no Hobby Lobby type lawsuits where you're saying, you know, they, they should be paying for this. No, you pay for it yourself. And you have relatively few things that impact upon your major medical insurance, your catastrophic insurance. So guess what? The cost of that plummets. It's sort of like a homeowner's insurance that has a high deductible. You don't impinge upon it very often. The cost goes down very, very dramatically. And you know, I've had a lot of uh, medical economists cost this out. It would cost considerably less money. The other thing is uh, you provide an opportunity for people to shift money in their HSA within a family. So let's say the dad is $500 short. He can get that $500 from his wife. She can transfer it to him from his HSA, or his son, or his granddaughter, or his father, anybody in the family. Think about the flexibility that that provides. Uh, you'll be able to cover virtually anything except something that's very, very major. And that would come, of course, out of your catastrophic insurance, which you can also purchase, because the money doesn't disappear if you don't use it. It just continues to accumulate. And some of the systems that we have now, at the end of the year, it all recalibrates. And you, only, and you have a limit. For instance, with Obamacare, with HSAs, you have a $2,500 limit. You have no limit here. It can accumulate to whatever you want. And there are many sources uh, that can contribute to it. And um, it works extraordinarily well. And when you're 
when you die, you can pass it on to a member of your family. So, you know, you're 87 years old, you got 13 diseases, and, you know, you, you get to decide, let's see, I got all this money in my HSA. Should I spend every last dime of it being put into ICUs and poked and prodded until I utter my last word and give up my last breath? Or should I pass it to my daughter or my granddaughter? That's going to be a pretty easy decision. And you're not going to have all these people talking about death panels and all this kind of stuff. And these are the kinds of things that really empower people in their own lives. It also brings the whole medical care system into the free market economy. That's what actually drives price and quality. So there's incentive for pricing, there's incentive for quality. All of these things are going to work extremely well. And uh, you will have an opportunity from afar to see the battle that uh, is going to rage because, um, you know, Obamacare is not going to work. It's, it's not sustainable financially. It's going to collapse. But I'm not sure it was ever meant to work. Um, it was meant to create a catastrophe so that you could go to single-payer system. Uh, but we're going to have another system in place that people will understand and will desire. So I don't think that that's going to happen. But it's one of the reasons, though, that I feel it is so important for us, for people who are actually involved in health care, who actually understand health care, to be the ones who craft the solutions for health care. Not for bureaucrats, who may mean well, but they do things the way bureaucrats do things. And we need to do things in a logical way. We need to be able to look at history and see how you know, that is integrated into the solutions that we propose. And it will make all the difference in the world. The other thing that I don't know, you may not have this problem in this nation, but tort reform. Uh, you cannot have physicians practicing medicine with a constant threat of a lawsuit because it affects the way that you do things. It makes you order more things than you should order. It completely alters what you're doing. It changes relationships between you and patients. And what you have to have is some type of a no-fault system uh, where you do take care of people who sustain medical injuries. But the cost of taking care of those people will be considerably smaller than the cost that we incur now with all these lawsuits, which do nothing but make lawyers rich and uh, don't really, in many cases, help the patients that much. We need to be able to immediately take care of their issues, make them whole, and keep people working without being stressed, without being pulled into court, without having things hanging over their head. And, you know, I asked Howard Dean, who ran for president some years ago. Some of you may recognize that name. Uh, he was the guy who said, and then we're going to Michigan, and then we're going, yeah! And, then, and it kind of ruined, everybody thought he was a nut. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I don't agree with him on much. Uh, he is a physician, a pediatrician, but he's a nut. But, uh, <laughs> but he is an honest nut. And, uh, you know, he was at a public forum, and they said, uh, why is there no tort reform in the Affordable Care Act? And he said, because the Trial Lawyers Association gives us a lot of money, and they don't want it in there. And that's always a problem when you have a lot of special interest groups dealing with things. As far as I'm concerned, the only special interest group for us in medicine should be the patient. Thank you. We have a few moments left for questions. Oh, here we have one here, please. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I mean, we have talked a lot about technology, but what I personally found always, the main problem is actually the information um, 
um, difference between uh, the physician and the patient. Because if you have a physician who is relatively self-assured in what they know, they have an opinion, they tell it to the patient. Most patients, they don't have that level of information and they don't really dare to question their physician. So if we can get a bit more in that direction that patients are better informed and are able to question it, my question would be, can the physicians deal with that well? Well, who's got to answer? I'd just, David. I'd, I'd have one response to that, and I'll bring in uh, an answer to this, is you recognised in an issue in terms of this communication, uh, and it comes down to like a power sharing arrangement, that there's actually a real risk, and it's a patient safety issue around cultural competence. So, so in a situation of cultural differences, even though you, for me, I may be thinking that I'm delivering the information that the patient needs to be able to make a judgment on the basis of the information I provide, if there's any the issues that I'm not being culturally aware of from their situation, then that, that's a real risk. So I think that is something. I, I think this sort of uh, communication is being brought into our education system in terms of the medical school. So from a doctor's point of view, I think certainly at our level now, generation, we're aware of it and we're trying to do it, but I have great hope that the, the upcoming generations are far more aware and much better at it than we are. Yeah, Lance. Yeah, just to um, e echo that, one of the key things I teach the training doctors that are coming through with me is that in their final plan and management plan for the patient is they should have some information to take away that's meaningful to them. The, the, the problem is we actually, and, and Anne um, pointed out, we're time poor and we spend a lot of time on our gathering our history and our investigation process and, and then we, we might spend a couple of seconds saying what the problem is and this is the treatment because we're very good at that. We get taught how to diagnose and treat but I think we're very poor at the information and now we actually, if we rely on everyone in this room having an expert knowledge on how to transfer that knowledge to a really a, a wide group of people that come into our practice, then we'll probably fail actually. But this is where technology has its benefit again. Someone sitting in the waiting room with an iPad that can click on their own form of technology and the own language they want to hear, whether it be a literal language or just the, the way it's presented to them. Knowledge transfer is probably the biggest um, area we need to work on. Yeah. Thanks. WebMD and some of these other information sites I think are actually very helpful. And uh, a lot of times patients would come in, they would be armed with a great deal of information. Mm -hmm. And I always praise them for that before I re-educated them. <laughs> Be because, you know, obviously there's no way that they can, can possibly understand all the nuances. But, you know, when it's done in a very nice way and, and make them a part of the healthcare team. And I would always explain to the, to the residents that, you know, unless you can explain to a patient what the problem is and what you intend to do about it in a way that they can then explain it to someone else, you really haven't done your job and you really shouldn't be operating on them. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Yes, one down front here. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful afternoon. My name is John Collins. I'm a retired surgeon, but I travel internationally looking at systems in medical education. And I've recently completed the review in New South Wales the major, major issue or the challenge is how are we going to change how young doctors see all of this, particularly in the first five years after they graduate, before they become established and the Aston Martins are what, what's it? My GP yesterday said the only thing that young doctors seem to be interested in is possessions and so on. How do we actually change the mindset of medical graduates in the first five years, which is what international information is now telling us we should do, how do we change how they see things and how they put the patient at the centre of everything? Anne or Dr Ben? Um, good question, <laughs> Professor Collins. <laughs> um, generations are different, I guess. But 
The caring professions need to practice values and we need to understand how to walk in the shoes of the patients that we try to help. And I think we need to understand how to select people into the caring professions from a values base. And it's, as an orthopaedic surgeon said to me once, and he really meant it, um, we can train people in the competencies of orthopaedic surgeon, surgery. It is difficult to train people in the values that help us walk in the shoes of others. And it's a really hard thing to do, but if you've ever been a patient, and I'm sure almost all of you have been, you understand that the power differential is very different no matter how hard anyone works to make it the same. And we answer. always have to appreciate that. Um, yeah. I don't know, it's not perhaps the erudite answer, but hopefully it's the values-based answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, look, I'm sorry, but that brings us to the end of our, our, um, our session today. I, I guess what we've heard is how important uh, technology is going to become in supporting the people-type decisions and the people-type needs. That technology is not going to be where we actually make our decisions. We're still going to be making those ourselves as health professionals and caregivers. And, but we will learn how to use technology to support uh, probably a lot more decisions over the next, uh, the next period. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for coming. A great um, opportunity for us to uh, share time with thought leaders, uh, international and national thought leaders, and so I'd like you to show your appreciation. Thank you.